live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It's Friday, February 23rd, 2018. Happy birthday to my lovely wife who was home from work today and uh, hopefully sleeping in. Hopefully we're not waking her up with the ruckus downstairs in Kegro in the Morning World Headquarters. And uh, wow, so much to talk about today. Uh, so much so that uh, I will immediately remove myself from the air and uh, play some taped material instead. Now, I, I do want to remind myself, though, that uh, while the issue is still fresh in mind, and it is still fresh in mind, I'm sure we'll be talking about guns and the issues surrounding them, at least for a part of today's show. And as I mentioned yesterday, Paula Apenis had sent me a, uh, well, as recorded segments go, a little bit lengthy, but uh, a, a interesting entry on the subject and uh so so long in fact that i couldn't make it fit i think it was the length actually of the file that i couldn't fit into my soundboard but i've rigged up itunes special today so we should be able to play it without any further engineering and i appreciate that and i don't want to i don't want to limit people to the amount of time they can take but uh well all right that might be the outside number anyway uh, no particular plans today, though plenty of items in pocket that I've been holding for a couple of days that I think are of interest and probably necessities heading into the weekend. Friday is very often around these parts indictment day. That's what we're living with as a reality with this president on Friday. We hand down indictments, but to the, for this week, the indictments came down on Thursday. And I'm behind on what's in them. They are, uh, they include a revised indictment against Paul Manafort. Things have gotten considerably worse for Paul Manafort. And, uh, it's chiefly a situation of his own making. He has once again been incredibly, I don't know. I mean, should we say lax in operational security? Except we don't want to encourage anybody to do better and more efficient crimes. But, uh, he has, uh, let's say, I don't know, he has acquired more rope with which to hang himself. <clears throat> My attention immediately prior to coming on the show, because I am essentially Donald Trump, uh, coming at things from the opposite direction. You can attract my attention immediately before the show with some kind of fun story that, uh, perhaps no more revealing than any other, but deserving of time on the air. But if I've been holding a, an interesting story for five days, I can be immediately distracted from it by sensationalist headlines like the ones I am seeing this morning about Donald Trump being a cheapskate bastard. It is extremely easy to, of course, uh, get interested in such a headline. And it is Occupy Wall Street, or at least their uh, Twitter presence, which has brought this to my attention. And uh, they're using a Raw Story article on it. Uh, their coverage summarizing the work of the Daily Beast in this case. Trump D.C. hotel paid millions in fines shortly after the inauguration for stiffing contractors. And uh, a fam familiar story, of course, about Donald Trump. And that's, uh, that's the headline on the Raw Story piece which often offers us a good uh, encapsulated summary of the longer investigative pieces. Let's borrow from that then. Tom Baggioni on this, uh, on the byline for Raw Story, just prior to his inauguration, President Donald Trump personally intervened to resolve over $3 million in construction liens against his Washington, D.C. hotel property, the Daily Beast is reporting. They've got a little bit more detail on it. Maybe we'll dive into that. According to the report, Joseph J. Magnolia Incorporated, a family-owned D.C.-based company, <clears throat> had filed a lien for $2.98 million on December 21st, 2016 for the unpaid balance for work done on the hotel, dating back to September 9th, 2014, for plumbing, mechanical, and HVAC work, HVAC, I don't know, do people say HVAC? I think so, uh, but I'm not a 
uh, I'm, I'm not a contractor. I, I, I might be disqualified from the uh, heating and air conditioning debate as a result. Anyway, that along with site sewer, water, storm, and water services per the filing, well, it is was known that liens had been filed. The dollar amount had not previously been known, nor was it public knowledge that Trump stepped in at a time when his children were supposedly running the company as he assumed the presidency. You know, you need something done. You got to do it yourself. You know how it is with the kids these days. With regard to the Trump International in D.C., Magnolia's attorney, Michael P. Darrow, said in an email to the Beast that Trump actually called my client the day before the inauguration. He waited until the last minute and they reached an agreement over the phone. So I was instructed to close out. I was never privy to the exact terms, but JJM, I believe, got most of their money, I guess is what he's saying. Three dollar signs. Joseph J. Magnolia Incorporated as JJM pressed to clarify that the Trump mentioned in the mail was, I guess, email was the president. Darrow declined to comment, referring questions to John D. Magnolia saying he may well be willing to chat with you because it's a fascinating story. Magnolia, who supported Trump for president, and even though he wasn't getting paid, how do you like that, refused to comment after inquiries from the Beast. So a uh, very interesting story and just, you know, illustrative in many ways, as I was pointing out uh, this morning. And once again, behold the jobs that the so-called wealthy uh, create and scare quotes around that too when they get their tax cuts. Give the wealthy tax cuts and they'll invest in job creation and projects that create jobs and people will be working as construction workers and plumbers and heating and cooling contractors. They won't get paid, but they'll be working, you see. So uh, yeah, thanks for the jobs, by the way. Also note that when Trump and his friends and other wealthy people create jobs, right, Nobody gets paid. Nobody gets paid until until someone hires a lawyer to use the keys that are left for the rest of us to leverage the power of big government. Big government steps in and lo and behold, people finally get paid. Rich people give them tax cuts. Do people get jobs and get paid? No. It's only when you leverage that big evil government that's supposedly standing in the way of people getting jobs and getting paid comes into the picture. The only thing bigger and badder than a rich guy with a good bunch of lawyers is the government and they make you pay. And poof, all of a sudden people get paid. So free enterprise, capitalism for you in action. I could have gone with that hashtag rather than free enterprise. I probably should have in the end because after all, uh, well, the the fact that uh, it's not legal to just go over to the you know, the rich guy's house and beat the crap out of them and drag the money out uh, is a construction of our, you know, our system. Capital. Capital wins in most cases. And you get to hold on to it until you can prove to a government court that you were entitled to the money. There's no honor system or beat the crap out of you system. We established a different system that if you have money, you get to hold on to it unless you're able to prove that uh, you've incurred costs on behalf of this other party in exchange for a promise of payment. But really, that's what's behind all payment. I mean, I guess whether wealthy or not, nobody necessarily feels morally compelled to pay their workers. And that's not their very often not their primary motivation. It's the threat of, well, the threat of sanctions, I guess. Note here, though, once again, the threat of sanctions, not enough for Donald Trump, you had to go and enforce those sanctions in order to get him to finally pay up. So lots wrapped up in that story. Like in most stories, you can extract a number of interesting themes from a from a single report. Well, welcome to the show. Daily Coast Radio is live now, and we have been for 10 minutes, as we were forewarned by Bill in Portland, Maine. What have we this morning? KGROX, that's me. Hi, I'm David Waldman, host of the show. You can reach me during the show at KGROX on Twitter and uh, demand a different direction to the show. I may ignore you. I may not. KGROX may bag the talking today. Good idea. And pull out his old salsa records. All right. Stay tuned. I don't know if enough people really on the show who listen to the show like salsa. I think people just like to say salsa, and that might be enough. All right, what else have we got here? 
Uh, a number of things happening this morning. Like I said, guns still in the news. People still debating the various questions swirling around uh, the gun issue. Here's something I don't quite understand. I have seen a couple of different versions of this. I, what I think, and I just might not be understanding it correctly. What I think is a plea from people not to pay attention to, not to take seriously, not to waste time arguing about uh, the proposal, well, the main proposal all out of the, uh, the ridiculous looking mouth of Donald Trump, the word hole that he uses to spew at all of us, uh, proposing armed teachers in our schools or proposing somehow arming our teachers. It's a, it's a very bizarre version of a very old proposal. And I don't know, I've seen a couple of people urging us not to take it seriously, not to allow it to distract us from some other part of the debate. And there's a, you know, there's a very serious point to be made that there are perhaps other policy wins to be had if we can keep the focus on them and keep the pressure on them. But the argument that we ought not to pay attention to the argument about arming teachers because it's deeply unserious and they're only proposing it so that we get caught up in the debate and they don't really want it doesn't seem right to me but it's being proposed in a way i mean this the idea of ignoring it that makes me think maybe there's some different point to this and and i need to sort of approach it carefully and allow people to try and make that point to me and see if I can be convinced because I certainly have mixed feelings about a number of approaches to a number of issues, not just the guns. So maybe this would be one of those situations, but I've not yet seen anyone explain to me uh, why that, why, why ignore, and, and some people say, well, don't ignore it, but just don't engage with it. And what's the difference between ignoring it and not engaging with it? it, it the thing is, it's being proposed as a an approach to this problem, this proposal, in a way that makes me wonder whether, I mean, not everybody follows the gun issue as closely or in the same way that I do, uh, though they very often follow very closely and in a different way. And so they come away with a slightly different understanding of what's happening. Uh, equally valid, perhaps, but not the, you know, not the same perspective. My thing is here, uh, it seems like it's being argued that we should ignore it because it's not serious and it's being offered as a distraction from the real debate, whatever it is, as though the people who, who propose this non-response are unaware of the fact that it's really happening right now. Like, I guess they think, well, there's no armed teachers in my state, or that's not allowed in my state, or, or any state, because that's the way I understand the United States of America. It's not happening near me, so it's not happening. Obviously, we, you know, we have people with broader and more open minds making this argument, but uh, I, I, I do get the sense that they don't know <clears throat> that there really are states that have implemented this and are implementing this as we speak. And I don't really understand what the benefit to our side, whatever that is, is by not engaging when, I mean, you know, this is one of those situations where when somebody tells you who they are, you listen to them because they're usually telling the, usually telling the truth. Now that's not the case with the president of the United States. So I guess that's a counter argument, but um, here's the thing, uh, you know, people were offering me ex explanations like, well, you know, this comes up all the time and they never do it, et cetera. Or he's the president and nobody's proposing federal legislation to do this. And so therefore we shouldn't worry about it, but it's not a federal issue to, to date. It hasn't been a federal issue. It's states, state by state <clears throat> that are opening themselves up to this enormous problem. And we always have mocked the idea as unworkable and stupid. It just hasn't really done anything. So, I mean, going back as far as the Columbine massacre, following Columbine, that issue got, you know, suggested. It was not as widely discussed as it was after Sandy Hook, but after Columbine, people thought, what about putting more armed guards 
in the schools? What about allowing teachers who have concealed carry permits to carry their weapons at school? And, you know, it was laughed at and mocked a little bit. And I guess it wasn't engaged uh, directly. <clears throat> and while we were all busy not engaging with it and saying it was deeply unserious, Utah went ahead and adopted the policy. And since 2003, they've actually made it considerably easier. And it's a weird, like, um, I, I use, I've used the term on the show before, procedural posture that we're talking about here in that what's happening is it isn't so much that states are passing new laws arming teachers. The, the way the, uh, the Utah activists think of it, and, and, and remember here that the chief gun enthusiast activist guy in Utah is Clark Apotian, whose name has been called on the show before, head of the Utah Shooting Sports Council, which is sort of the Utah NRA. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a one-off organization. But Clark Apotian has been on our gun fail list before. He's had an AR-15 stolen out of his car, parked in his driveway, because if you know your, your neighbors with Clark Apotian, you know that if you bash the windows of the car in, you're going to come away with a pretty awesome gun. So excellent job there, whoever did that. Thanks for putting a uh, semi-automatic rifle, assault rifle, in the hands of a criminal. Appreciate it. He also got himself into some domestic violence and restraining order hot water at some point, though it's unclear whether that was valid or not and, uh, you know, went through the court system, got adjudicated, and I, I don't think it came up, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't hold. And I think the... Uh, the charges were dropped and the restraining order was dropped, but uh, he, he was having a dispute with his ex-wife and decided uh, allegedly to drive his two and a half ton army surplus vehicle over her lawn, honking the horn and screaming at her. And that's the kind of guy you want to hand military style weapons to. He obviously has a fetish for them. Anyway, he's not the, you know, coolest guy in the world. But uh, he was the one behind this push, and in 2003, they, they did. They began allowing teachers to carry the weapons, and his characterization of how that happened, legally speaking, was we're not arming teachers, we're just passing state laws that prevent teachers from being disarmed. What they did, essentially, is they said, all right, in our state, a concealed carry permit entitles you to carry your weapons even in a school despite the federal encouragement through various mechanisms of creating gun-free school zones. We're just not going to go along with the government's, the federal government's admonitions and encouragements to us to keep our guns out of the schools. And uh, from now on, that's what your concealed carry permit entitles you to do. Utah is a weird case. I think they were first out of the box in affirmatively doing something to allow this. There are a few states out there technically that don't have any laws on the books, uh, either enforcing the federal incentives or agreeing one way or the other, uh, agreeing with or, or uh, um, overriding or, or purporting to override anyway, the federal guidelines on gun-free schools. Uh, and so it's technically possible that a concealed carry permit would entitle you to bring your gun to school. And if you really want to be a test case in those, I don't know, two or three states out there that have literally no law on the matter, I guess you're invited to go ahead and do so. But, uh, you know, well, one of them's Hawaii and that's not very likely to happen there. Uh, anyway, it hasn't been an issue to date in most of those states. <clears throat> But in a state like Wyoming, it might become one. Uh, and I think they are one of the states that doesn't have a law on the books about it. But Utah was the first one out of the box to go ahead and do that uh, do that thing they did and uh, allow people to use their concealed carry permits to carry in schools. Kate Sherrill updates me. Apparently a shooting at a university happening right now. This from the Associated Press, breaking news. Officials at Southeastern Louisiana University say two people injured in an on-campus shooting. We'll see if we can find any more details on the nature of that. Of course, you know, um, uh, everybody, uh, 
uh, pointing out, I know what you're thinking, everybody, but remember, Arthur Delaney says, just because it's a shooting at a school doesn't mean it's a school shooting. That's true. We'll find out exactly what it was. And uh, remember also that sometimes school shootings are armed people who bring their guns to school to protect themselves from school shootings who accidentally shoot themselves or someone else. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how this one comes out, but keep an eye on that. Anyway, uh, as we said, the uh, the the um, issue of arming teachers has come up before. We all I don't know. I guess we all laughed at it and I don't know whether we all dismissed it or not uh, at the time. But in 2003, Utah went ahead and. Uh, pulled the plug essentially on the barriers to carrying your weapons in school if you're a teacher. Uh, following Sandy Hook, the issue, of course, was proposed again and roundly mocked again. And I don't know how much pushback there was on it. Of course, I began collecting stories of gun fail shortly thereafter, as it seemed to me the proposal was getting more and more serious attention. Despite my efforts, uh, and I guess despite the efforts of others to mock the idea so that it just plain went away, at least at the federal level, Texas went ahead and adopted similar laws and has since seen its teachers begin to carry concealed weapons in the classroom. Now, after Parkland, we find ourselves facing the issue again, being admonished to ignore slash mock slash walk away from it, and it is now on the legislative docket, as I understand it, in Alabama. So I don't know what to tell you. I don't think that we're able to point at this um, approach of admonishing people to look away from the distraction of armed teachers because it's not serious only to have states begin implementing it piecemeal. And I guess eventually at some point the dam breaks and it'll be two, three, four states at a time. You know how Alec can work on issues like this. And I just, I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to explain to me why they think, it, in, in light of the fact that there are states implementing it and that in the states in which they've implemented it, um, you know, uh, we've already had teachers having accidents. Utah, like I said, first out of the box. And Utah, the first to have an elementary school teacher accidentally shoot herself during school hours on campus. So, you know, what can I tell you? Idaho uh, also followed pretty quickly after, uh, after Sandy Hook. And uh, it began with allowing university professors and, of course, within a couple of weeks, uni first university professor to carry his weapon during class, accidentally shot himself during his lecture, too. I, you know, you know what the cause and effect of allowing the policy to go forward is. You knew what it was likely to be. And then it actually showed up and we did see it happening. But... Uh, yeah, uh, why, you know, why the idea of staying away from this as a debate because it's so much of a distraction is catching on. I have no idea. So if you have an explanation, by all means, do please share it and uh, see if it's convincing or not. All right. Well, I'm keeping one eye on the story out of Louisiana, but it's no far, so far no further details just to... Uh, return for a moment to the Donald Trump not paying anybody to do the work on his stupid hotel that he shouldn't own anyway story. Uh, we'll go over, at least give some credit for the original reporting done over at the Daily Beast. Zach Everson was the author of the piece. Uh, Trump Hotel paid millions in fines for unpaid work. And in one case, a contractor was paid after getting a phone call from Trump, but we just don't know which Trump, but it was it was Donald Sr. In the days around Donald Trump's inauguration, and remember, again, he's under pressure now. I'm going to be in a big spotlight. The hotel bearing his name in downtown Washington, D.C., quietly settled two liens totaling more than $3 million for allegedly unpaid construction work. In one case, the contractor reached an agreement after receiving a phone call from someone his attorney identified as Trump. The liens had both been previously reported, but their settlements had not. And the fact that they were handled right around the time when Trump took office 
perhaps even at the behest of the then president-elect himself, underscores just how politically sensitive the management of the Trump International Hotel was and is to the current White House occupant. And by the way, that's, I'd say, pretty good evidence in the emoluments cases. But okay. The largest payment was made, uh, as we said, to Joseph J. Magnolia Incorporated. The family-owned, D.C.-based company had filed a lien for $2.98 million. Uh, is there a listing of who the other person is? Hmm. Well, anyway, pretty much same things that we heard in the raw story summary. Uh, also previously reported in the Washington Post. It says here, though, the John D. Magnolia, the company president, noted that he had voted for Trump and felt the Trumps had been decent people to work with. But he added Mr. Trump and Ivanka and so forth. I, they are, I guess, preoccupied by other matters now. That's the excuse he was willing to grant them. Shortly after that interview in which he noted that he had supported Trump, Magnolia's company was finally paid. And, and that's an interesting angle on things, too. Well, you know, uh, I'm, in, I'm, I'm having to sue him to get paid on my work for this hotel, and he doesn't seem to give a crap one way or the other. However, if I loudly proclaim in newspaper interviews in, say, the Washington Post, where Donald Trump pretty much is going to be spending his time now, he's going to have an eye on the Washington Post, that I supported him, wow, that has gone a long way towards settling the lien, which is, you know, kind of interesting in itself. All right, well... You know, well worth noting. Uh, I guess the other company or one of the other companies involved here, uh, A&D Construction, didn't work out as well. $79,700 in unpaid bills for woodwork, including the hotel's crown molding. Richard Sisman, attorney for the family-owned subcontractor based in Sterling, Virginia. What do you know? Uh, said he had conversations with representatives of the Trump organization regarding the lien, but not Donald Trump himself. They ended up negotiating with the general contractor and got, I guess, a partial payment not made public at this point. We'll be back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. And send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Good morning and welcome back to the Kegger in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, we probably got cut off just a little bit. All I was really saying at the end of my speech on the way into our first break was, well, okay, we'll return to the story after we get back. Uh, what we left lying out there was the uh, unfortunate story of A&D Construction looking for about $80,000 for unpaid bills in woodwork. As I mentioned, they are based in Sterling, Virginia, which is, of course, where Donald Trump hangs out all the time at his Trump National Golf Course in Virginia. So they're not far away. They could come over and protest at the entrance of uh, the golf course. But I guess they're probably not interested in doing that. Anyway, the owner here or an attorney for the owners, <clears throat> Richard Sisman, said he had conversations with representatives of the Trump Organization regarding the lien, but not Donald, the Donald himself, he ended up negotiating with the hotel's general contractor and reached an agreement around February 22nd, but it didn't end particularly well for his client, who, unlike Magnolia, had not publicly stated that he had supported Trump. Which, by the way, he should just go ahead and he should have gone ahead and said that, although maybe I don't know, maybe he did. Maybe he did support Trump. Maybe he supported Trump and didn't want people to know he supported Trump. Maybe he didn't support Trump and was afraid to say he did support Trump because he would be, I don't know, boycotted or something like that. I don't know what the situation is, but I mean, I guess, how does Trump know he supported? You should just go ahead and say so. Now, I guess if you're a donor, he could look that up. That would be, and that would probably be what he relied on to decide whether you supported him or not. But uh, that create well, that brings us right back to the emoluments problem, right? Without even 
ever accepting any money from a foreign government or for, from the United States government for payments for rooms uh, rented by uh, government employees or whatever without actually getting to the emoluments problem out there. We already have a conflict of interest problem before he becomes president and before he enters office and before he can collect on any of these emoluments. Essentially, if you did work on his hotel and you donated money to his campaign, you'll get paid. But if you didn't donate money to his campaign and he owes you money, you won't get paid. What a great deal. But that those are the kinds of things he, he thinks that's just making a great deal as opposed to being a, a filthy jackass and thief. But I guess we have a different worldview. Anyway, there's a little bit more to this story and we'll close it out this way. Uh, let's see. In addition, oh, uh, the, the attorney, Sisman, says he didn't walk away very happy. Let me put it to you that way. But he needed the money. In addition to Trump's D.C. hotel settlements with Magnolia and A&D, Maryland-based AES Electrical dismissed its $2 million lien against the Trump Hotel in March of 2017 following settlement talks, BuzzFeed reported. No details about any settlement were disclosed. Over the phone, a representative for AES Electrical's attorney said, quote, she won't be able to give you any information on that. I'm sorry. White House Deputy Press Secretary Lindsey Walters referred questions about the liens to the Trump Organization. The Trump Organization didn't respond to requests for comment. So, okay, that's the way this one comes out and uh, winds up. By the way, if I gave the impression that I thought that Raw Story had done something less than by reporting on the story from the Daily Beast, I should clear that up because, of course, uh, you will have noticed by now that the Daily Beast's reporting refers very frequently to previous reporting done by the Washington Post and BuzzFeed and maybe one or two other uh, sources as well. That's just common practice. It's not raw story only that does this, not the Daily Beast only that does this. And in both cases, proper attribution for the work. Uh, I didn't mean to imply anything about it by, uh, you know, by saying, well, raw story was relying on the work of, of the Daily Beast. Daily Coast relies on everybody else's work, too. This show relies on everybody else's work. As long as you tell people whose work it is, I think you're doing about the best you can with a low budget. Let's let's face it. That's what's at the heart of all of this stuff. Okay, so let's see. Now would be an excellent time, I think, to start on Paula Apenis' piece here. If I can uh, make the engineering work. Let's see. Where's my iTunes? As I mentioned, it was it's uh, just under 11 or 12 minutes. It runs uh, on mass shootings. Let's roll the tape while we still have a big chunk of time before our next break. And then we can perhaps discuss it afterwards. Hope you enjoy it. Take it away, Paula. Hi, David. I just wanted to bring to your attention a couple of different things that I ran into over the weekend, primarily dealing with the, uh, of course, the mass shooting and the potential things that might happen afterwards. I wanted to give a shout out to those amazing um, kids at the from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School who have started this whole movement to essentially delegitimize the NRA. Their goal is to make um, anyone that is in it um, takes money from it, supports the NRA, etc. That their involvement with the NRA should become a badge of shame. And boy, oh boy, I support that. What these students are doing uh, surprised us all, and. It kind of illustrates something that I say every so often when people start to become really discouraged, which is that you never know what is going to get us to the tipping point. And it, it, it often is something that you don't expect. And I think in, in the case of uh, the, this whole gun control issue, with these young people getting out there and sort of taking over and just having a very simple message which basically is the adults have screwed it up, our leaders won't save us, we've had it, and we're going to start pushing until you give. Maybe we're at the tipping point. Somewhat related to this was this tweet storm by Oliver Willis. 
or which he entitled, Some Quick Thoughts About the Gun Issue and Unsolicited Advice for People Pushing Reform, Democrats, Activists, Regular Folks. The NRA, GOP, does not want to talk about guns. They want the gun issue to go away. That's why the NRA goes into lockdown mode with every massacre, because they know that while there is tolerance for their gun yelling, it is super low right now. But if we have to talk about guns, the NRA and GOP wants the left to go full nerd. They want clinical descriptions of gun restriction measures, dispassionate talk about gun violence. Even statistics that don't favor their argument is something that they would prefer. What they don't want is emotion. This is their kryptonite in this debate, especially coming from kids, moms, and dads. If we discuss the victims of gun violence, the idea of bullets entering and obliterating the brains of young kids, of children drowning in their blood, that puts the GOP and the NRA on their heels. Their cold and clinical McGun rights argument doesn't work if you refuse to play by their rules. The imagery of elementary, middle, high school, and college gets hunted like animals trumps any nerd chat about trigger locks. Too long didn't read, embrace the very real emotion, never let up, and don't let them set the rules for this debate or any other. I think he makes a very good point, and I think that's what these students have done, is they've cut through all the various stuff that uh, the gun supporters use to obfuscate the issues by bringing it down to you guys are killing us and you're doing nothing about it and you can do something about it and you're not. Now, my understanding is that there is a march uh, planned for, I think, March 24th by these students, um, which we hope will be something that happens nationwide, like the Women's March and other other big marches that have happened. I, I think that's terrific, and certainly if uh, there's anything like that going on around where I live, I will participate or support it. But on a slightly different note, then, um, there was an article, brief thing, by Dahlia Lithwick in Slate, a new idea about how to stop school shootings. A nationwide teacher walkout could be the one thing to shake us out of our stupor. On Wednesday, as the nation grieved one of the worst shootings in American history, and journalists republished old articles that had been written about previous mass shootings in American history, elected officials, too, recycled the same threadbare thoughts and prayers left over from the last tragedy, although they at least have stopped saying thoughts and prayers. I did, though, encounter one new idea, a proposal made by education psychologist David C. Berliner that was posted on Diane Ravitch's education blog. And he had said, it's way past time. Between now and May 1st, teachers have to agree on gun legislation that they want. They can consult with Gabby Giffords and Mark Kelly and others who have suffered, such as parents who have already lost children to this horrible characteristic of our culture. If by May 1st they have not received assurance that their legislation for sanity in gun ownership will be acted on, they need to walk out of their schools. It would be a May Day when workers should exert their strength. Our country's legislators and voters who send them to make our laws can then choose teachers and most parents for sane gun laws or the NRA that provides our legislators money to avoid making the laws that could reduce the carnage we see too frequently. Almost all of America's three million teachers, nurturers, and guardians of our youth want sensible gun laws. They deserve that. They have to be ready to exert the power they have by walking out of their schools if they don't get what they want. They have to exert the reputational power that three million of our most admired voters have. Neither the NRA nor their legislative puppets will be able to stand up to that. My advice is to start meeting now, write model legislation, submit it to state and federal legislators, and if rebuffed, close down schools until you get what you want and the rest of us deserve. Save our children. So that was the end, evidently, of something that he had posted at Diane Ravitch's blog. So this is Dahlia Lithwick now. Berliner's solution was at once the most proactive and elegant thing I had seen in a day characterized by hopelessness and paralysis. I have been struck by the fact that teachers have the smartest things to say about school violence, masculinity, saving lives, and guns. That's because unlike craven politicians and the NRA, teachers don't get to hide from the victims of gun violence or predetermine when the moment for hopes and prayers has lapsed into the moment for business as usual. We should listen to teachers who aren't allowed to grow bored and move on. So she says she reached out to him, and they have a, a quick uh, question and answer. And she says, I found, find, found myself completely immobilized after the shooting and unable to write. I feel like I write the same thing every time. What possessed you to post this? 
And David Berliner replies, Enough? I'd had enough. After it posted, we got so many responses, including from the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association, that I had originally proposed May 1st, but we decided April 20th would be the day for teachers to close schools down or take an hour to walk around campus or take a day off to go to their legislatures with model legislation. Look, Alec and the NRA buy legislators with model legislation and a check. And so April 20th will become the day on which teachers can say, no, you will never be elected again if you don't pass sensible laws. There are all sorts of things that can be done that don't violate the Constitution. I have just had enough. She asks, what do you say to proposals that teachers simply be armed uh, themselves in order to protect their classrooms. And he replies, I don't even know how to answer that. I think that's what's known as hardening the target. You build a house made of bricks, the bombs just get bigger. Arming teachers doesn't solve the problem. We want children to feel safe in their classrooms. They shouldn't feel like they are under siege. They want and need a stable world, not one that they have nightmares about. When Arizona was considering passing a law that would allow concealed carry on campus, I wrote to every single legislator and told them I would never, ever give another student an F grade if the law passed. If they were worried about grade inflation, they should know that I would never deal with a kid who had an F grade unless I also had a gun, which is really the stupidest thing possible, students and professors all packing guns. The Old West died for a good reason. And she then says, what's your response to people who say it's unseemly to politicize a tragedy by talking about gun policy? His answer, but it is about guns, and I am making it about guns. I just can't fathom why people need to hunt using automatic weapons. I can acknowledge that there can be problems and disputes about interpreting what the Second Amendment means with respect to militias, but there are the kinds of normal precautions we can discuss about public safety. After 9-11, we enacted public safety measures in airports, for instance. It seems to me we have the same issues here. I'm not against shooting or hunting, but I don't believe we should let 14-year-olds drive or 15-year-olds buy a drink at a bar. And if the NRA is basically just paying people to vote a certain way, there has to be a cost. They have to know they will lose their jobs. So that's where that ends. Um, I just thought it was interesting that there would be the possibility of a teacher strike or walkout or some other major sort of teacher-powered protest or action on April 20th. Now, you might have seen this making the rounds on Twitter. It was a screen capture of a Facebook feed uh, by a woman named Tanai, or Tanau Bernard. I think it's T-A-N-A-I Bernard. And she writes, My fifth grader and I were conversing on the way to school this morning. As an educator, I wanted to be sure he and his classmates were taking the school safety drills seriously and not using them as simply a time to socialize and goof off. Me, have you guys practiced a lockdown drill in class yet? Des, are you talking about an active shooter drill? Me, yes. Des, yes, we practiced it. Me, so tell me, what are you supposed to do? Des, the teacher is supposed to shut and lock the door, put black paper over the windows on the door. Then myself and three other boys are supposed to push the table against the door. After that, all the class is going to stand behind us on the back wall. Me, the class is supposed to stand behind who? Des, me and the other three boys. We stand in front and they get behind us. She says, I internally went from zero to a hundred real quick. My child is one of only two black children in a class of 23. Being transparent, I immediately went to the, why is my black son being put in the front line? Just being real. So I asked, before I verbally stated my thoughts, why did you get picked to stand in front of everyone else if a shooter came to your school? Des, I didn't get picked. I volunteered to push the table and protect my friends. Me, immediate nausea. Des, why would you volunteer to do that? does. If it came down to it, I would rather be the one that died protecting my friends than have the entire class die, and I'd be the only one that lived. And she finishes. Father God, it took everything out of me not to break down. I still have a lump in my throat. Ten damn years old. This has to be our baby's thought process in America. And then there's a picture of this very sweet-looking black boy with a little New York Yankees cap on. That makes me emotional. I think that's some of what Oliver Willis is talking about. Again, I think that may be the power of the the student-led effort to deal with uh, gun control in America. Because I just think it's a lot harder to defend an abstract need for any idiot to be able to get their hands on an AR-15 or whatever. Because it's their right, because of militia, because of whatever stupid reason they give, when... 
the price that we pay is sending kids off to school every day and wondering if they're going to make it home alive. And I think the more that those messages become dominant, the closer we're going to get to some real solutions. So this is Paula from PaulaWriter.com. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. And, you know, a lot to think about in that. Uh, I did, in fact, see that exchange being traded around uh, Twitter, and uh, it's what I thought of the other day. And I think th- I think there's some more exchange to it uh, on Twitter, I think. And it, it might have been her who used the – or who uh, w- was first using the term – using kids as human sandbags against shooters. But I don't know. There's a lot of parents that are having the same conversation with their kids and – uh, finding, you know, co- coming to the same conclusion. Yeah, there's a lot of, well, I don't know, there's a lot of good, solid emotional value to bringing, you know, t- t- to this this part of the argument. So far, uh, it hasn't moved many in the NRA side of the argument. They apparently don't really care. And every time we, we rhetorically ask, uh, how many kids' lives will it take before, you know, or how many kids have to die before, the NRA and gun nuts will finally concede. And, you know, look, the answer is all of them. Because uh, sometimes even having their own kids killed in either uh, these situations or, or accidents with guns in the home doesn't convince them. They still think it'll come out differently next time. It's been really interesting. And, and the, the you know, the dynamics of the debate are such that, well, it's getting very clear and very obvious that you were really dealing with a particular kind of psychosis, I think, in all of this. And it's, I throw that around casually and uh, psychologists and psychiatrists will no doubt be upset about that. But I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm saying clip when I should be saying magazine. But there's very definitely some weird dynamics to the debate uh, that they that just don't make any sense. I don't know if this is an exact parallel, but I, this, this came up in my own work in trying to put together i'm still trying to put together a written version of the arguments i've been making to you on the show for the last couple of days about what i think is the so far still unexamined point of the arm the teachers idea not just that oh my god we can have an accident not just that oh my god liability issues would become enormous and by the way, along the way, I learned uh, that in, in Utah's case, or in particular, uh, in the, uh, let's see, I would say probably the most aggressive of the school districts inside the state of Utah is probably the Granite School District. I don't know how Utah divides up its its school districts. I'm not certain what that is, the Granite School District. You know, it represents a certain area of the state encompassing a number of municipalities it's all etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know, i don't know is granite the county i don't know i think it's actually bigger than that anyway what i encountered in my casual reading about it is that the granite school district was the one that was most aggressive in getting its staff armed uh, and in fact at least at the date of as of the date of some of the articles i've been reading about them and their policy and granite the granite school district i came to my attention because it is the home school district of the westbrook elementary school in i think taylorsville is that the name of the the town in utah where that sixth grade elementary school teacher accidentally shot herself in the foot and blew up the toilet back in 2014 and uh that's that's the district we're talking about they were uh, one of the first to really aggressively implement this program, and it was the you know the the Granite School District teachers who first volunteered to get trained by the Utah Shooting Sports Council when that publicity push was going on. As a matter of fact, I noticed that one of the teachers from articles uh, about the program being implemented you know, earlier in the early mid to two thousands, same teacher name came up then. And then in 2014, and then again, now she's, she's obviously a very active voice in the pro armed teachers camp. So, uh, they, they do have that roster, that bench to go to, but I noticed they were very aggressive in training their teachers. 
of course, they were the first one to have an accident, which is probably not coincidence. And like I said, they were really aggressive. They, the Granite School District apparently is the only one, at least they like said, again, as, the day, as of the date of the articles I was reading, to have established their own school district police force. There are other schools that rely on school resource officers supplied by the municipalities or counties or whatever in which they reside. But the Granite School District was the first, I think, to and maybe the only one to come up with its own police force. And what I found interesting about the the way they approached arming their police force was another one of those instances in which the gun uh, enthusiasts slash gun proponents, the, you know, the pro-gun folks, uh, pro-arm teacher folks, etc., um, have sort of, well, you know, they, they operate on a, on a series of, a pre- of premises that are not necessarily internally consistent in there. A little bit, a little bit gimmitarian, I guess, is what we're saying here. Uh, so I noticed a pattern that emerged, but let me just give you just the basic recitation of the facts of what they've done here from Education Week publication, uh, which you'll find at edweek.org. And this goes back to October of 2003, Bess Keller, with the name of the writer at the time, I don't know whether she's still with Education Week or not, Utah grapples with concealed guns in schools. Again, this is 2003. And other uh, reports I've seen, television reports of the time that are still online, you can play the video. Uh, the, The suggestion is made by the anchors there. I don't know if they got it right, but the suggestion was that this came about post Columbine. Columbine being 1999, and uh, the debate took longer than, I guess, anticipated, but it was uh, described in the news reports of the time as having been motivated by the Columbine shooting. Uh, this article in 2003 recites it this way. Are schools safer when teachers pack heat? So we've been asking this question for a long time. That question continues to roil the political waters in Utah as school district leaders there come to grips with a new state law allowing teachers and others with permits to carry concealed guns in schools. Around the nation, 34 states, this is 2003, 34 states have passed laws allowing members of the general public to carry concealed handguns if they have permits. Look at how, you know, naive we were back then. This is post 9-11, of course, but 2003, post 9-11, yes, post Columbine, yes, pre Virginia Tech, pre-Sandy Hook. Uh, We were still at that stage when only 34 states allowed concealed carry. I think we're done with that now. Almost everybody allows concealed carry, and almost everybody is now a must-issue state. We've come a long way in a very short period of time. The NRA has been extraordinarily effective in leveraging concessions out of people and getting what they want piecemeal. Uh, almost as if we hadn't noticed a long way. We now we, we know where we are. We know we're in a crazy place with guns. But consider, it wasn't until when uh, that uh, the uh, the assault weapons ban expired. And let me get the. I feel like I need to check my facts on that one. Um, what's the assault weapons ban Wikipedia entry say? That's our quickest, easiest. Um, uh, uh, reference point here because my recollection is that yeah okay so it was a 10 year ban and a 10, 10 year sunset on it and I recall that it was enacted in, in uh, 1994 so it expired on September 13th 2004 now even before the expiration of the assault weapons ban in 2004 they are an issue in the Utah Situation. We'll get to that in a second. But think about, again, how far we've come. The Heller decision, uh, everybody's got a personal right to bear arms at all times. The expiration of the assault weapons ban, uh, the expansion of must-issue uh, licensing and permitting. And, and for those who don't recognize the terminology, uh, it, it used to be in the olden days that uh, Trump wants to restore by making America great again. 
gun licensing permitting and particularly concealed carry permitting was done at the discretion of, well, you know, uh, the, the local sheriffs, essentially, which is supposedly a conservative position and even in keeping with a lot of alt-right, wacko, new right uh, positions as well, that they're the, they're the only law enforcement officers with any legitimacy, you know, that whole stupid argument. Uh, but basically the local law enforcement agencies differed a little bit from state to state, had the discretion. They were given the opportunity to review applications for these permits because there were few enough that they could do that. People didn't really want or need concealed carry all the time back in the olden days, but now everybody does, and we believe that society is only safe if everybody's got it for whatever reason, or we're told to believe that. Now, we don't actually believe it. But, uh, that, you know, the, the local sheriff could say, no, that guy's crazy or he's well known as, uh, I don't know, I, back at the times there was a wife beater or whatever, that these people are dangerous or it doesn't make any goddamn sense. And uh, gun enthusiasts got angry about that and considered it to be an infringement on their Second Amendment rights. And sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. But essentially what ended up happening was they came up with a cookie cutter Alec style law. And it might in fact have been Alec that promoted it that, uh, which they noticed that the laws usually said that at the discretion of, uh, you know, people apply and at the discretion of the local law enforcement authorities, the local law enforcement, law enforcement authorities may issue the sought after permit, whether it's concealed carry or permit for the gun at all. And they said, well, with a simple language change, we can change it to, well, if you make the application and give the local sheriff or local constabulary the information they need to make a decision, uh, well, they, they, they change it to a must issue. We say from now on, the law will say once you comply with the ordinance and file the paperwork, the sheriff must issue you that license and sometimes they said unless there's some compelling thing that you can prove in court but that changed the nature of licensing forever and other states adopted it and now we're there with almost 50 states taking a break we'll be right back welcome back to the k grow in the morning show here on net roots radio done with about an hour's worth of the show already and we're still on the gun issue <laughs> Uh, I have a feeling it's going to occupy a lot of our time. Uh, before I continue with my train of thought here and read you the article that I have on Utah's history with armed teacher, uh, teachers, it's more than one of them, uh, we have this question here. Real Jingy has uh, offered us via Twitter. Why not take the gun rights argument to the anti-abortion teams to make getting a gun less appealing an option, huh? Why not get any would-be gun owner to view the violent and accidental gun deaths as a collage prior to performing the purchase? It is, uh, I like the thought. I like the thought of using their tools against them. One of the real issues with making it work is there's a lot of gimmitarian impulses here. And a lot of people are there to say, I don't really care about the consequences on other people or even uh, that's why I want the gun is to blow those people away, preferably if they're the wrong color from my perspective. And I don't really care about that stuff or everyone else is an idiot and I won't have that problem. That happens a lot, too. And I think that's what drives a lot of the insistence on the gun, the pro gun side when, uh, to to say, oh, there's no such thing as a gun accident. All these issues are, you know, that you're finding in gun fail are negligence. And I'm not a negligent person. You know, it's got a left approach too, and they're quite correct in trying to press it. But I think that's what comes up fairly often. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I think the tool works for those of us who are logically consistent and those of us who are not, nothing works. So it's not that it's a bad suggestion. It's that you're talking about trying to deal with bad people and we might need something else. It's not a bad idea. Like I said, it's just we're we're aiming at a bad target. Anyway, let me continue uh, after that suggestion with this piece, because I, I do think, again, it's revealing that back in 2003, we're dealing with the quaint notion that not every state is a must issue state. Not every state will give you a concealed carry. Not every state will allow concealed carry. And these guys are already moving to concealed carry for teachers in class, but they don't stop there. 
But let's go back to the way the article lays it out. Around the nation, 34 states have passed laws allowing members of the general public to uh, carry concealed handguns if they have permits. But most of the statutes, including more than a handful passed in recent years, put school property off limits to such weapons or let school districts ban the guns if they so choose. In Utah, though, legislation passed last winter. And again, this is uh, that would be uh, uh, late 2002 to early 2003, I guess, last winter. Legislation passed last winter took away the authority from school boards to exempt school property from the concealed gun law. So in other words, we're also talking about a prototype, an early prototype of the state level preemption argument that state gun laws would be rewritten with the proviso that no subordinate political entity municipalities, counties, school boards, etc., would be able to be more restrictive in their gun laws than the state is, that that was a ceiling to gun restrictions. That, too, we have seen metastasize and move from state to state to state until, you know, once again, all the, the quaint la- gun landscape of 2003 is long gone. So there we are in Utah, new legislation, right? exempting school property from the concealed gun law that cast into stark relief the question of whether guns under someone's jacket or in someone's handbag add to or detract from the safety of school children look at that framing i mean they're being pretty neutral here pretty both sidesy for education week don't you think yeah you know, we're having a real debate we're not sure whether guns in Jackets and handbags add to or detract from the safety of school children. It also puts school boards in the awkward position of carrying out a law they, even in Utah, by and large abhor, while writing policies that will protect them legally and actively discourage school staff members from exercising their new right. Proponents of allowing concealed weapons in schools argue that schools, like other spaces with lots of people, are less likely to be invaded by attackers when they know there could be a, quote, good guy with a gun around. They also point out that the people who carry guns under a state permit system are unlikely to be careless with their weapons, minimizing the risk of accidental injury or death. I don't know why they think that, but they do like to point it out. It's not particularly true. Uh, And there, or I guess I should say there are enough exceptions and or just plain mistakes made, even if you don't believe in gun mistakes, that it hardly matters. Eventually, you're going to have what you had in Taylorsville, uh, a teacher accidentally shooting himself in class Uh, or worse, because this article's not done. Opponents, though, uh, in which in Utah include virtually every education group despite the fact that they're doing this, contend that people with state-issued permits aren't necessarily marksmen and that in a crisis, innocent people brandishing guns make the job of police more difficult. In other words, they knew very well, very not hard to imagine, that even, even in the ancient days of 2003, teachers were against it, politicians and gun groups wanted it, Teachers and sensible people everywhere pointed out this could create enormous problems in liability, enormous problems just for the safety of the kids. We don't know how the outcomes are going to be. It's it's a bad idea overall. And still it happened. And part of my point, you know, we can ridicule all we want. We can make all the same arguments. We can point out that, yeah, nobody's asking the teachers what they think. All the teachers could be universally against it, pretty much, or whatever. The rest of us could say it makes no sense. It's crazy. It's stupid. It's a distraction. But it could happen. It happened in Utah under the same circumstances. Granted, it's Utah. But tell me in 2003 you were worried about Donald Trump becoming president. I mean, we just went through this, even right with the election of Donald Trump. Well, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's ridiculous. He's a clown. It'll never work. People say, well, that's what they said about Reagan. Yeah, but the, he's no Ronald Reagan. Well, now he's a president. So is he? I don't know. Maybe he is a Ronald Reagan. Okay. So there we were in Utah. Everybody opposed to this thing and they adopted it anyway. I worry every day about an incident like Columbine, in which two students at that Colorado high school went on a shooting spree, said Stephen F. Ronenkamp, the superintendent of 
the Granite School District in Salt Lake City. But I also worry about the situation that could arise because people in our schools are not trained in gun use or don't have good common sense. Slowly, Utah districts are coming forward with policies and strategies in response to the change in the state's concealed weapon law. So that's your superintendent of the Granite School District. I worry every day about something like Columbine, but I also worry about the situation that could arise in our schools because people in school are not trained in gun use or don't have good common sense. This is the superintendent of what ended up becoming the most aggressive implementer of the new Utah law. So moving on here, uh, policies clamp down is our next section here. In a move applauded by the state affiliate of the National Education Association, the state's two largest school districts have approved policies that clamp down on concealed weapons in their schools without banning them. That's, that's as far as they could go under the new law. The policy put in place by the 70,000 student Granite District, as the new law went into effect in June, defines the lawful carrying or use of a weapon as, quote, outside the scope of employment of district personnel, suggesting that the district will not accept liability for any gun-related mishap. So what we learned from this article and along the way in the rest of our research is that I was not correct in asserting that Utah um, was able to deal with the question of liability by granting blanket immunity to everyone. The first reaction, I don't know how the law stands today or what the legal posture of school district insurance is today. But back in 2003, the Granite School District, which opposed the whole thing, but ended up implementing it rather aggressively, as you'll see later, uh, came out and said, well, we're going to deal with it this way. You, The law says we can't stop you, but we'll put it this way. If you have an accident, whether in the process of stopping an active shooter or just walking to lunch or whatever, you're not covered. We don't accept the liability. If you shoot yourself, whether during an active shooting or while you're on your way to or from the lunchroom or in the bathroom or what have you, you're on your own. And the teacher in Taylorsville learned that lesson pretty quickly, too. It also prohibits employees from revealing to anyone in the school. This is the Granite School District policy. Also prohibits employees from revealing to anyone in the school, anyone in the school, that they have a weapon and from using district property for storing it. The Granite School District uh, required that the gun be kept on your person at all times and not stored anywhere. And you're certainly not allowed to use district property for hiding the weapon. We don't want this thing here, but if you're going to bring it, you're responsible for carrying it. And if you shoot yourself, you're responsible for whatever happens. Anybody you shoot, any accident, any liability that attaches is yours and not ours. That's the way... They went about it. But again, please do note, it prohibits employees from revealing to anyone in the school that they have a weapon. And as you know, the situation in Taylorsville was uh, the teacher who had her accident uh, had accidentally revealed the weapon to everyone all the time. She was routinely accidentally revealing that she had a gun and it didn't impact her ability to carry the gun in any way, shape or form. It was it had to wait for her to shoot herself to finally get rid of this teacher. But, you know, like I said, uh, had they, and, and this was um, in Granite, which like I said, is pretty aggressive, but two, the superintendent was opposed to the policy and still they couldn't bring themselves to tell this teacher, you know what? You reveal your gun too much. You got to stop bringing your gun. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not going to work out. And I saw somebody on Twitter and I think it was Scott Charles. Yeah. Our friend from Philadelphia, who implemented the fantastic gun lock giveaway program there in response, at least in part, to our gun fail stories, uh, who was pointing out, yeah, this is going to result in some awkward conversations. Imagine having to be the administrator who tells the teacher who immediately applies under the new, the envisioned new law allowing teachers to carry their weapons. I have a concealed carry permit. I want to carry my gun in the classroom Imagine being the administrator who has to tell that teacher who everybody knows and has, you know, darkly hinted to you is a little off and maybe isn't the best candidate for being one of the armed teachers that we allow in our school. 
and telling them, yeah, um, about that. Uh, I have reason to believe that you're maybe not the best choice for that. Now, this is a person who owns a gun and has a concealed carry permit. And you're telling them, one, professionally, you know, uh, your colleagues think you're maybe too dangerous and unstable to do that job. And now, of course, that President uh, Trump has said, eh, maybe we give everybody a little bit of a bonus, too, if they carry a gun. So now that you're telling them you're going to miss out on some bonus money, maybe, if that if that ever comes to fruition. Maybe that never happens. But you're you're saying, yeah, your colleagues think you're a little cuckoo and they're afraid of you. And that's a weird and an awkward discussion to have. It's not going to happen. They're going to let them do it. They're going to let them do it. And if they do it one day when everybody still has respect for them, but they go cuckoo because they're carrying a gun and that changes your psyche and your approach to everything, how do you undo it? You know what? We decided this gun is making you crazy. You got to give it up. Oh, yeah. Well, you can pry my gun from my cold day. Oh, my God. It happened again. They never go back on it. Or even if they don't act cuckoo crazy, look, the policy says you can't reveal the gun. You can't. You cannot. That doesn't mean anything to somebody with a gun. You cannot. You cannot have my wallet. You cannot tell the government that they can't serve a, a subpoena on you. They point guns at you. You cannot. Yeah, people who have guns, you cannot tell me that it's improper to stick the gun in the face of the McDonald's drive through window person if they forgot your fries. You can't tell a gun person anything on the spot. Now you're going to tell them, you know what, we, you've been carrying the gun successfully for a while, but we think you're a little kooky now. Stop it. That's not going to happen. Or you're revealing the presence of the gun too much. You're in violation of the policy. That worries us. We have this policy for a reason. You can't stick to it. And so we doubt your ability to conduct yourself safely. And if you can't conduct yourself safely with a gun on while you're milling about the room six hours a day with sixth graders, I'm worried about what's going to happen. Oh, come on. You're exaggerating. You're an idiot. You, you libtards don't understand anything. Pow! I shot myself in the leg. God damn it. Why didn't anybody do anything? Because you wouldn't let us. You had a gun. The school board for the 75,000 student Jordan District, also in the Salt Lake area, approved a similar but slightly narrower policy in July, back in 2003. Their district policy states that if a teacher brings a concealed gun to school, it must remain with the teacher at all times. Martin W. Bates, who oversees policy for the Granite District, says that... Uh, about 10 of Utah's 40 districts have asked for copies of his district's new gun rules. So I guess they probably implemented something quite like them. Pat Rusk, the president of the Utah Education Association, the NEA affiliate, said she believes that eventually every district will draft a policy so teachers will know what they can and can't do with regard to concealed weapons. Clearly, the battle over the issue is not over. Many teachers, for their part, believe that the risks for school employees and students grow when any adult might be concealing a gun. I hate to think of a day when there is a teacher-assisted suicide, said Ms. Rusk, who suggested that a student could think, I'm going to make my teacher blow me away in front of the other kids. While she's sure that some Utah teachers back the law, Ms. Rusk added, I haven't had anybody tell me personally I feel safer now. Safe Havens for Learning, a coalition of education and church groups in Utah, has filed suit against the state as part of a campaign to put the issue of guns in schools before the voters. In August, the state judge upheld the University of Utah's longstanding campus gun ban. The ruling prompted the Safe Havens group to call for the legislature to reconsider the changes enacted last winter. I guess it didn't work. The chief sponsor of the legislation wants to extend the reach of Utah's concealed gun laws, Senate Majority Leader Michael G. Wadoops, a Republican, wants wants to repeal. I'm sorry, wants to appeal the court ruling and sponsor a bill that would override the University of Utah ban. And I'm pretty sure they actually did succeed in doing that. Utah being one of several states since then allowing campus carry. Um, oh, uh, the the issue I I meant to get to about Granite being or ending up being one of the more aggressive. Uh, districts is actually in a different piece, which I have here. And if I let the auto playing video go, maybe I should do that. You will hear the news reporter <clears throat> aforementioned 
uh, news reporter for the ABC affiliate there, uh, give you the same explanation I got from her when I listened to it about what the motivation for the armed teacher law in Utah was. Maybe let's let's in fact do that here. Uh, uh, it'll be playing in the background, but let's let's do that. After Columbine and before Sandy Hook, a Utah school district made what some consider to be a drastic step in securing their schools. Good evening, I'm Kim Fisher. And I'm Don Hudson. Thank you for choosing ABC4 Utah at 10 o'clock. Now, Granite ISD armed its school police officers with semi-automatic rifles. There you go. And that's what we were getting to. That's what made Granite School District the more aggressive of, of this whole group here this uh is there, is there a date on this piece here i don't know if i can find it how is it that we have a write-up uh out there that's undated hmm well that's pretty odd but uh, uh anyway i'll accept their explanation for it, that it was after columbine but before sandy hook that the 2000 law you know 2003 law was uh well clearly chronologically we know that's when it was written but that that columbine was at least in part, the motivation. So you heard uh, the anchors begin on the next topic. Granite School District arms its school officers with semi-automatic rifles. So I know your eyes are rolling already and you're saying, oh my God, AR-15s. You're right, in part. But just pause once again to recognize what we're talking about. Now, after Columbine, before Sandy Hook, a Utah school district made what some consider to be a drastic step, right? The Granite School District is the only district in the state with its own police department. That's what I mentioned. That's what makes them, I think, the most aggressive of the group, or at least as of the date of this article, which we don't know for whatever reason. I'm reading to you from the website of goodforutah.com. The ABC affiliate is Channel 4 there. Good for Utah. Okay. So the Granite School District is the only one with its own police department. They employ 15 officers to watch over 92 schools, again, including the Westbrook Elementary School, where the teacher shot herself in 2014. Their number one goal is to protect their students. And in order to really do that, the district says it needs to arm their officers with the same weapons the bad guys are using. Okay. Okay. So we see what the excuse is here, right? Well, we got to be able to at least match the firepower of the bad guys who are coming. And by the way, they know that when people come to shoot up schools, they come with semi-automatic rifles like AR-15s. It's it's obvious to the police who are assigned the job of protecting the schools. What kind of guns do you need if you need the same guns or even more powerful guns than the bad guys have, what are you going to need? You're going to need an AR-15. Why are you going to need an AR-15? Because everybody knows that when you shoot up a school, you bring an AR-15. Duh, they shoot fastest and most accurately and most powerfully and kill the most people. Come on. Oh, because yesterday when I asked you why we couldn't just ban those things, your answer was because they're no different from any other semi-automatic gun and everybody's got semi-automatic weapons. Your basic handguns that are out there most of the handguns in circulation in America are semi-automatic. How can you distinguish between them and, and what you're calling assault rifles? There's no difference between them and what you're calling assault rifles. That's not even a category. In other words, if the question is, hey, can we ban assault weapons? The answer is no, because it's impossible. You can't distinguish between so-called assault weapons and every other semi-automatic on the market. Of course, people then say to that, good, fine, ban every semi-automatic on the market. I don't care. And I hope you will bolster your argument from now on with the information I shared with you some time ago. And we'll share with you again that every semi-automatic weapon on the market, yes, including those little handguns that people buy uh, to carry with them in their purses or whatever, are capable of bump firing without a bump stock. You can do the same thing, and uh, there is no device necessary, as Donald Trump says, to turn legal weapons into machine guns. Anybody can do it, and the instructions and demonstrations of it are all over YouTube. I've shared them enough already. But uh, in other words, so when the question is, can we ban them? No, because there's no difference. Now, if the question is, hey, can I buy some assault weapons? Oh, yeah, you bet. And it's a good idea, too, because if you go up against a shooter with an AR-15 with a semi-automatic handgun, 
you're going to be cut to ribbons. They're going to blow you away and tear your body to pieces before you even get that thing out of its holster. Oh, so there is a difference then between the two guns. You couldn't put your finger on it when the question was banned, but when the question was sales, you differentiated between the two very, very nicely. Instead of, I don't want the $200 semi-automatic handgun because that's garbage it can fire quickly true but it can't fire as uh, it can't send the bullets out of the muzzle with the same velocity and power it doesn't shoot the same ammunition which tumbles end over end when it finally makes contact with the target therefore tearing human flesh up far worse and uh, creating that much more damage than handguns. It's faster, it hits harder, the bullets tumble, it's less accurate, the handguns. Uh, Far better and more efficient killing machine, the AR-15, than the Smith & Wesson 380 that I was going to sell you. Not to mention the fact that the Smith & Wesson 380 was uh, 200 bucks and the AR-15 is six, eight, $1,000, $1,500, depending on your model. Okay, so now we've discovered that there is an appreciable difference between every semi-automatic gun on the market and these so-called assault weapons. If you want a different name for it, I guess we'll grant it for the sake of argument. But AR-15, it's a different kind of gun. P.S. P.S. I told you the Granite School District was the most aggressive because they had been the first to establish or maybe the only to establish their own police force and i've illustrated for you that yes they think that they need assault weapons in order to compete in the marketplace for bodies with mass shooters so sure they went and got themselves ar-15s they have how many uh 15 officers they bought 12 ar-15 rifles well that leaves three officers in a in a bit of a spot Right. Don't you think now, of course, we're learning the news uh, today and we actually learned it yesterday that there a was, in fact, an armed guard at the uh, Parkland High School. Again, where are we? Uh, Mar- Marjorie Stoneman. Was it? Da? Uh, I can't remember anymore. Douglas. Is that right? Do I have? I, why can't I remember that name? <sighs> but at the school in question, there was, in fact, an armed guard. And uh, we're, we're learning. Uh, and it's a really delicate point that the armed guard was in the parking lot in his vehicle, as they like to call him in police jargon, at the time of the shooting, and he never went into the school. And I don't know. I mean, on the one hand, my initial reaction, I think a lot of people's initial reaction is, damn it, you're, that's what you're, your whole job here is to be there as an armed guard in case a shooter comes in. You're supposed to do something. And on the other hand, you, you know, after a second's reflection, the guy heard what was going on. He knew probably right off the bat that it was an AR-15 he was facing in there. Because, come on, who else? Who who goes? You can't do a good school shooting these days without an AR-15. you got to be prepared. He knew what he was facing, and he knew what kind of gun he had, and he knew that, just like the Granite Police, he, Granite District, School District Police here say, you'll be torn to pieces in an AR-15 versus any kind of handgun battle. You're just going to be sacrificing yourself. Of course, some people say that's what you're supposed to do, but I I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. I'm not going to put myself in that guy's shoes. He's really honestly probably needs to be on suicide watch at this point. He's probably beside himself for not being the hero that everybody expected him to be. Not to kill himself because, you know, freedom. The guy had to be able to get an AR-15 at 19 years old. Um, But so, like I said, uh, does that put the uh, this guy uh, or the uh, Granite School District Police in a bad position? They have 15 officers and 12 AR-15s. Why stop there? Did three officers decide that they were cowboy enough, maybe, to take on the shooters with their regular sidearms? No, no. Three more guns were bought. M16s. I told you that the Granite School District was super aggressive in their approach. uh, 15 officers, 12 armed with AR-15s, and three armed with surplus, military surplus, M16s. Man, oh man. I mean, really, at this point, tanks, rocket launchers, what else are we missing? Granite School District spokesperson Ben Horsley. 
Uh, I don't know if he was around in 2003 or not, but he's here for this uh, article, whatever the date is on this one. Ben Horsley says, uh, I think our parents would be pleased to know that literally everything we can do to keep our kids safe is being done. This is a school district spokesperson, not a police force spokesperson. So uh, I don't know. Maybe there was some political evolution between 2003 and, let's say, 2000. Well, let's see. This mentioned Sandy Hook. So post-2014, the district wants M16s and thinks its parents will love it. Interesting evolution. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching Kegro X or David Waldman or Kegro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Somehow had the uh, volume on our music uh, jump up accidentally here. I had my finger on the trigger in gun parlance and probably shouldn't have. Uh, by the way, just by way of uh, uh, CPAC update, we really haven't paid much attention to CPAC this year. And it's probably because we get all the crazy we need from the White House. And CPAC is a lot less of a crap show, an S show. Uh, by comparison to our day-to-day existence than it ever has been before. But uh, Trump is speaking at CPAC, so all the crazy is on top of crazy. They are doing their Lock Her Up chant. It is, of course, February 2018, and they are still chanting Lock Her Up. And uh, Trump, now done, as Joan says, with Morning Parkland's dead, gets back to taunting dreamers. Of course, he got people riled up with uh, gun issues as well by saying uh, the Democrats will take away your Second Amendment, folks. So they're going to take away your Second Amendment. They're just going to do that. And so everybody believes that. And uh, here we are. OK, let's wrap up with what was going on in Utah back in 2014-15. Uh, they got themselves some M16s for their cops over in the Granite School District. In 2005, as part of the U.S. Department of Defense's 1033 program... Armando, you paying attention about uh, military surplus? That's how this happened, right? The, uh, as part of the U.S. Department of Defense's 1033 program, the school district acquired three surplus M16s. Following year, they equipped the rest of their officers with AR-15s, a poor man's substitute for fantastic actual military weaponry. In a rapid response, this is interesting. As Again, this is uh, the spokesperson, Ben Horsley, explaining why... They opted for AR-15s and M-16s. And, uh, you know, we've heard this argument before. But again, please consider it in the context of you can't differentiate between semi-automatic weapons of any kind and assault rifles. Well, well, like I said, when the context is sales or sales pitches or justifications, they find it pretty easy to differentiate. In a rapid response, they're not going to be waiting for backup. They're going to immediately go into the school. And if they're faced with a simple handgun or a shotgun against an AR-15, and he, he constructs his sentence very poorly here. He's not talking about the police being faced with a simple handgun or shotgun, but rather if the shooter is being confronted with a simple handgun or shotgun, as most police often have, but instead, and, and they're going up against an AR-15, if they're the shooters are faced with a simple handgun or shotgun against an AR-15, they're going to be outgunned, the police are, and that's not going to help us save lives, explained Horsley. He flips back and forth between the persons involved here. But essentially, he's saying, if our cops are going to be immediate response and not wait for backup, unlike what they did in Parkland, Florida, because he only had a simple handgun or shotgun, if they're faced 
If they have a simple handgun or shotgun against the shooter's AR-15, they're going to be outgunned, and that's not going to help us save lives. We want AR-15s because there's an appreciable difference in the way you can use them and in the way they operate. The outcomes are completely different with an AR-15 versus a simple handgun or shotgun. Okay, great. Well, we think we should ban those things for civilian use. You cops can have them, I guess. Probably we would still concede in the end, right? But we want to ban them for common civilian public ownership. The general public shouldn't have access to these things. You can't do that. You, you, you wouldn't be able to write the law in any way that would differentiate between them. Okay, I want to ban the ones that can blow away bad guys with those weapons because I, I understand they'll still exist police should have them and if you see someone walking down the street with one you should be able to stop them and say "Ho, oh, hold on a second that's a banned weapon we're taking that and of course they'll say well you know local ordinance says you can't even ask me well we banned those things well why you can't differentiate between this and a handgun sure i can uh or or if you think I can't fine give me your handgun too what's the difference I'm taking both of them oh well uh, uh in that case uh yeah I can differentiate here's the rifle you know okay uh, I think they'll be able to work it out so there we are to see how the AR15 differs from a handgun or a rifle any just general rifle and that's an interesting point too remember Marco Rubio just said it doesn't differ from a rifle to see how the AR-15 differs from a handgun or a rifle, we went to the experts at Get Some Guns and Ammos. Uh, guns and Ammo. That's the name of the store they, they visited. They, we need an expert. I'll go to a gun store. That person's an expert. They're not. They're an owner of a gun store. They might know an awful lot about it. But by, by the way, Get Some Guns and Ammo. Good name for a a store that has it. Now, I, I, like I could name my ice cream shop Get Some Ice Cream. But remember, remember who we're dealing with. We're talking about uh, military fetishists and gun enthusiasts and gun nuts. This is not the, hey, come over to our store to get some guns and ammo. It's the get some guns and ammo. You see, you're going to come here to get guns and ammo so that you can go out and get some. See, Horsley said a shotgun is good for close proximity, a handgun similar. But when you're looking at taking out a potential suspect who's running rampage in a school, this guy needs is a school district employee, he, by the way, uh, not well spoken. So when you're looking at taking out a potential suspect who's running rampage in a school, you need something more precise. Now, the reaction from the public, on the other hand, is mixed. And by the way, just f pausing for a second. The TV people are the ones who are writing this thing, and they're the ones who say, to, to see how the AR-15 differs from handguns or a rifle, and they misspelled rifle. It says riffle. But to see how it differs, we went to the experts at Get Some Guns and Ammo, and there is no quote from anybody at Get Some Guns and Ammo in this thing. They immediately instead go back to the district spokesperson, Ben Horsley, who tells them, well, you see, a shotgun is good for close proximity. A handgun is similar. But when you're looking at taking out a potential suspect who's running rampage in a school, you need something more precise. Thank you, spokesperson for the district. I understand. I got your position. I came here to get some to find out something from an expert. But I guess I found out nothing. The article just rolls on. Don't even pay any attention to the fact that you promised a comment from these people. Moving on. Reaction from the public is mixed. It's ridiculous, said Robert Valdez. I don't understand why a police officer needs to have an automatic weapon inside of school. Eh, of course, it's not an automatic weapon. You're disqualified from the debate. But, well, I, you know, I can. I mean, I'm willing to entertain the necessity of a semi-automatic rifle inside of a school if you're up against somebody else with an AR-15. Uh, if you're Marco Rubio, though, theoretically, you should say, no, I don't understand the need for a semi-automatic rifle in a school because they can't differentiate between a semi-automatic rifle and a semi-automatic handgun. I don't understand. I can't figure it out. Matching firepower is exactly what the Granite School District Police Department is doing, and they make no apologies for it. I want bad guys to know that we have those weapons. I want them to know that if they come into one of our schools, that this is what they're going to be faced with said Horsley, who I'm becoming increasingly convinced is actually a spokesperson for the Granite School District Police Force, though they never identify him as such. 
In the nearly 10 years since they've had these weapons, the district tells, uh, says, well, that's what it says, the district tells, says, hmm, their officers have never had to fire, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't be ready if they ever needed to. The officers are certified on their weapons twice annually. Can I inspect those certifications? One question. Just uh, And I think, generally speaking, with police, you're, you know, you might have a fight in doing it. They certainly won't offer up the certifications to anybody who walks in. The union will fight you, but you might be able to FOIA those records because they exist. And that's one of the differences between arming just anybody with this crap and arming police with it. Why shouldn't the general public be able to have access to this weaponry? One reason, besides the danger of them actually just going or running rampage, as uh, Ben Horsley says, uh, there's the danger that their certification is fake. And you'll never be able to look at it and find out because they're a private citizen and they don't have to show you anything, according to state law. Whereas if you get access to your weaponry through a public police force uh, that has promulgated real policies about who can wield these weapons and what training is required and has a real record keeping apparatus that can be inspected theoretically at least even if it takes you a long time and doesn't help you on the spot if you are confronted with them and their weapons or they shoot you but theoretically after the fact you can inspect that stuff and say it turns out that guy was not properly certified or as we discussed yesterday it turns out that the guy who certified him is a certified lunatic, a, a, a loser who uh, pretends he's in Delta Force when he really went AWOL as a tank driver. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. But, uh, yeah, that's another thing we're going to have to do in pushing back on all this. You should absolutely ask, how do I know you got special training? How do I know you passed it? How do I know it was really given? How do I know the whole thing wasn't forged? And they'll dismiss you as being uh, pedantic and uh, outlandish and a weirdo, but you'll be right. All right, moving on to a couple of other subjects. Once again, uh, faced with our uh, 11 o'clock deadline and trying to get you the rest of the news that you'll need to know for the weekend. Let's throw a couple of things out quickly. One, yet another Trump nominee having to withdraw for being an idiot for one reason or another. This time we are talking about the Trump nominee for Indian Health Services withdrawing his name, his name, her name, I don't know, from consideration, ah, Robert Weaver. Uh, there we are. President Trump's nominee, now we know it's a he, for the top position on the Indian Health Service, IHS, has withdrawn his name from consideration. The Wall Street Journal reported Wednesday. I am reading to you from The Hill. They are reading to me from The Wall Street Journal. They're no different from Raw Story. Robert Weaver, an insurance broker and member of the, oh boy, haven't we done this one before? It's an Oklahoma tribe. Kapaw, Quapaw, do you think? Q-U-A-P-A-W. I believe we've actually hit on that tribe before too. The whole tribe. We, we're hitting on all of them. They're very attractive people. Uh, the Kapaw tribe in Oklahoma, appointed in October made the decision after the journal reported that he had exaggerated his career history. It is amazing how many people this is happening to in the Trump administration. Considering that they're all the best people, they are either child molesters or inflating their resumes or were wildly unqualified to begin with. It's odd how often this is happening. Those reports raised tough questions from members of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee his withdrawal leaves the IHS, a division of the Department of Health and Human Services that provides care for federally recognized tribes in the U.S. without an immediate replacement. The post hasn't had a permanent leader since 2015. So not good news in that sense, but, uh, well, it's kind of good that we weeded out another wacko loser from the uh, potential Trump administration. All right. What else have we got here? Um, hmm. Let's hit a couple of highlights here. There's more on the Trump Hotel and its problems, um, uh, but this more on the emoluments side. I'll just note for the record and include in the roundup this article from the Washington Post. Uh, Tammy Abdullah and Stephen Braun from the AP, in fact, on this story, uh, reprinted in the Washington Post. Book Trump, that is the hotel room, interest groups press case at his properties. 
Payday lenders got regulators to rethink rules on how closely to vet borrowers. E-cigarette makers got a delay in federal oversight of many vaping products. Candy makers praised the decision to hold off on more stringent labeling standards. And title insurers declared victory for getting changes that benefited them into the tax overhaul. What do all these American special interest groups have in common? They were among those that booked meetings, retreats, and conferences at hotels and golf resorts owned by President Donald Trump. No surprise there. More entrance in the big-time emollient scan. He's bigly stealing from us, folks. You can review the rest of that article over the weekend and uh, wave it around angrily when you're confronting people over the weekend. Next up in the roundup, uh, uh, lightning round, I guess, roundup, uh, an entry from The Guardian that uh, drops some dirt on another close Trump associate, and it's not at this point directly connected to the rest of the investigations dogging the Trump administration, but uh, it's only a matter of time. Close friend of Trump investigated over alleged 170 million euro tax evasion. It's expressed in euros, and so you won't be surprised to find out that, uh, well, one, they're talking about euros, and two, it's in English and I can read it, so it must be The Guardian. Real estate mogul Thomas Barrick, that's the uh, the guy who ran the inauguration arm of things, a close friend of Trump's and uh, I think, tre- is he the treasurer or the president of the, the inaugural fund? He's in control of the $120 million slush fund. Uh, he's under investigation in Italy and he played a critical role, of course, in Trump's 2016 U.S. presidential campaign. The article notes... Stephanie Kirschgassner and Lorenzo Tondo on this piece. And I guess they're reporting from Italy on this. A close friend and major fundraiser for Donald Trump is under investigation in Italy for allegedly evading 170 million euros. That's 190 million dollars in taxes after the sale of a luxury resort on Sardinia's Emerald Coast. And you'll never believe what else goes on on Sardinia's Emerald Coast. It's the beach playground frequented by... Gulf Arabs and Russian oligarchs. Amazing. By the way, if you're listening in the UK, you don't care about euros. You want it expressed in pounds sterling. It's 140 million, 147 million pounds, uh, 170 million euros, 190 million dollars. But you're Brexiting soon enough, right? Thomas Barrick played a critical role in Trump's 2016 election campaign and inauguration and has been described as one of the president's key advisors outside the West Wing. At the heart of the allegations against Barrick in Italy are claims that he and associates in his private equity firm, Colony Capital, orchestrated a complicated scheme involving Luxembourg-based companies to shield tens of millions of euros from Italian tax authorities after Colony's 2012 sale of the Costa Smeralda Resort to gutter the country for 600 million euros, 670 million dollars. Barrick and other executives have not formally been charged with wrongdoing. A spokesman for Colony Capital declined to comment on the allegations against the company. According to a legal document that was prepared by a prosecutor in Sardinia and obtained by The Guardian, Investigators used wiretaps uh-oh, in their inquiry, which is a fairly common practice in Italy. And I guess you, we don't know the Italian uh, process for authorizing wiretaps, so we can't be too sure about what was going on. By the way, the allegations are against both the company and its executives. That's why Barrick is in some personal hot water. Last year, Barrick helped to recruit his longtime close friend, the former lobbyist Paul Manafort. <laughs> I said there was no direct connection, but hmm, maybe there is. Last year, Barrick helped to recruit his longtime close friend, the former lobbyist Paul Manafort, who had a history of lobbying on behalf of Russian and Ukrainian interests close to Vladimir Putin, to join Trump's campaign. Manafort served as the campaign's chairman before he resigned. Manafort, who went yachting on the Mediterranean with Barack, Barrick, <laughs> Barack, see? Uh, after, I assume he says Barrick, B-A-R-R-A-C-K. Has anybody heard it pronounced out loud? Hmm. After his departure from the campaign, uh, he is now, of course, Manafort, a key figure in the FBI's investigation into alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and the Kremlin. Barrick, 
who saved Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch from foreclosure while the singer was still alive, and uh, there's that weird child molestation theme rearing its head again, was the first major business figure to lend Trump his stamp of approval, calling the Republican candidate intrinsically and academically first class and kind, compassionate, empathetic. Can you imagine describing Donald Trump as empathetic? That's just stupid. Anyway, okay, fine. Uh, but question, why would Tom Barrick be involved in saving Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch from foreclosure? Got a question about that. It's a linked article in here. So I don't know. Maybe I'll dive into that off the air one day and see if there's anything interesting. If so, I'll come back with it. A recent profile described the real estate mogul as impeccably fit at 69 years of age, I assume. <laughs> Otherwise, if he's just impeccably fit at 69, that's what it says. It's, that's the quote. He's described as impeccably fit at 69. That is either his age or TMI. His close friend and business partner, the actor Rob Lowe, again, fit at 69, could mean anything, with whom Barrick and others bought Hollywood studio Miramax before selling it in 2016 to, okay, a media group. You might not know the name of the media group. Can you guess what country the media group is based in? Did you say Qatar? Because you would be right. That's weird. Eh, he likes Qataris. Uh, and anyway, so, uh, he's a friend of Rob Lowe's. They bought Miramax. I had no idea Rob Lowe had an interest in Miramax. It sold it to a Qatari media group. He told the LA Times, uh, wait a minute. Rob Lowe told the LA Times that Barrick used his private plane, that is Barrick's private plane, the way his own children, Rob Lowe's children, Barrick's children, used Uber. I'm not even sure what that means. I don't even know what that sentence says. I don't know why I'm hung up on him being impeccably fit at 69. When I got him on the phone, or get him on the phone, he's as likely to be in Riyadh or Paris as he is to be in L.A., Lowe told the newspaper. The fact that Barrick is sitting at the table with Trump should make everybody happy, he said. Why? I don't know. In the long, oh, I'm sorry. In the run-up to the election, few endorsements of Trump seemed as personal as those delivered by Barrick. Donald's natural alliance is with the little guy. Stupid. Barrick told Charlie Rose, <laughs> history has been unkind to so many people now uh, because they've been so unkind to so many women. But Barrick told Charlie Rose during the national the Republican National Convention last year, he's a disruptor. Ooh, buzzword. A man who can step into the middle of the fray and take the heat. No, he can't take the heat, but he is a disruptor. The Italian investigation into Barrick's financial activities in Sardinia is unrelated to Trump and Manafort, but it relates to, maybe, maybe, it relates to Barrick's dealings with Qatar. And Barrick, who speaks Arabic and began his career working for the Saudi royal family. Oh, I wonder if Barrick is like an anglicization of his real name. Hmm. Not sure. I'll have to look him up, look up his background a little bit. He's kind of a mystery man. I understand he's impeccably fit at 69. Anyway, he's also seen as having influence over Trump's Middle East policy. Okay, just for a second there. Trump's Middle East policy. Who's supposed to be in charge of Trump's Middle East policy? Jared Kushner, right? There's a little bit left here, but let me just read you one more paragraph before branching off because it, it brings another word back into it. Shortly before the U.S. election, Barrick called for a, quote, radical historic shift in the U.S. outreach towards the Arab world. Sounds like almost knowledgeable. Singling out brilliant young leaders in the UAE, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, whom he claimed, or who he claimed represented the region's best hope. I don't know whether all three of them or just Saudi Arabia. Writing in Fortune, he also said that, quote, the only solution to the Syrian war is one that works with Russia and not against them. That is also kind of weird. Barrick's business ties to the Gutter Investment Authority, or QIA, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, and its 2012 purchase of four luxury hotels and acres of undeveloped land in Sardinia, which were acquired through a subsidiary of QIA, are now under intense scrutiny. Okay, uh, one more quick paragraph only for context. Details of the allegations are complex and involve several entities that are based in Luxembourg, a tax haven, and the U.S. state of Delaware, also 
uh, often seen as a tax haven or where many shell companies are incorporated. It's very easy to do there. Deutsche Bank, which also serves as a private bank for Trump and his close family, has been mired in legal troubles in the U.S., advised Colony on the deal. So, gutter, 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 right? Uh, Deutsche Bank, got a little bit of Luxembourg in there. Um, guy speaks Arabic, is seen as a big influence on policy toward the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. Next story, I'm going to stop with that one. Next story I wanted to bring to your attention before we head into the weekend is from The Intercept. And uh, it's a re-up of an old story Ryan Grimm and Clayton Swisher teamed up on, and they've uh, renewed the story. Jared Kushner, Cutter Redux. Robert Mueller enters the fray. We said that there was no connection in all this. I didn't say it. The, uh, the Guardian said it. This article that I was reading from The Guardian, though, is a May 29th, 2017 entry. I don't know what has happened since then. It was offered to me, it looked like, as a news story. But in fact, uh, maybe it was being offered to uh, point up the fact that it's now no longer operative. Because gutter, gutter, gutter. Uh, Senior counsel Robert Mueller is probing senior White House aide Jared Kushner's attempts to secure financing. Remember this? For a distressed Manhattan property, 666 Fifth Avenue, right? After the 2016 election, including pitches made to investment firms in China... And gutter, several news outlets reported this week. Remember that the family group was basically selling green cards to Chinese investors, micro investors for their purposes. If you give half a million dollars, we'll give you a green card. And then you can uh, reunify your families later. The, but then he also went to the Sovereign Wealth Fund, right? The attempt by Jared Kushner's father, Charles, to secure funding from Gutter before and after Donald Trump's election up until the spring of 2017 was first reported in July by The Intercept and later confirmed publicly by a Kushner company's spokesperson. The property that is now tied up in Mueller's probe, as well as linked to a diplomatic crisis in the Middle East, amazingly enough, sits at 666 Fifth Avenue. By the way, you want to throw 666 at the Middle East whenever you can. And was bought by Kushner at the height of the housing bubble for what was even then considered an inflated price of $1.8 billion. The building is now severely underwater. And if Kushner can't find refinancing sometime in 2018, the property risks blowing a hole in the family balance sheet. Kushner has worked doggedly to fend off that reckoning, talking with prospective investors around the globe. As The Intercept reported last July, Charles Kushner solicited funds from Qatar's former prime minister, Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim, known as HBJ, who now runs the investment firm al Kab Capital. The Qatari, Qatari, Qatari businessman pledged to provide Charles Kushner, then heading the Kushner companies in Jared's place, with $500 million in capital, provided Kushner was able to raise the rest of the multi-billion dollar refinancing elsewhere. Charles Kushner reportedly turned to China's Anbang Insurance Group, for an additional $400 million, but the holding company pulled out of the deal in March of 2017 following conflict of interest claims. Imagine that. Left in the lurch, we now know that Jared Kushner just weeks later devised a plan with Saudi Arabia to form a coalition with the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Bahrain, to jump Qatar, an unexpected move given the Qatari emir had joined Trump in Riyadh just weeks before the blockade started where no issues were raised with Gutter about any of its policies or relationships. We've almost skipped ahead in discussing this, but do you remember Gutter, of course, the subject of a blockade led by the UAE and Saudi Arabia, well, right about the time when their sovereign wealth fund decided, nah, we're not going to bail out Jared Kushner. Angered, perhaps, President Trump's chief aid on Middle Eastern policy inside the White House, anyway, says, yeah, let's drop the hammer on gutter. Which, I don't know, did that upset Tom Barrick or please Tom Barrick? I'm not sure. It'll be very interesting to read over the weekend whether there are more amazing coincidences between that story and this one. Anyway, I just thought you ought to have it on hand for your review during the weekend. I could have spent all day on that one too, but gosh, we're still wrapped up in the gun thing, and I have a feeling that's going to be the topic of discussion in most uh, most 
homes around America that are interested in politics anyway over this weekend. So I think we've uh, probably armed you best by spending time on uh, the example of Utah, the first one out of the box with arming their teachers, first one to have teachers shoot themselves in school, and the first one to jump at the chance at buying surplus M16s, and the first one to come right out and tell us what the big difference is between assault weapons and everything else, even though Marco Rubio assures us at the behest of the NRA that there is no difference. Okay, time for now to hand over the microphone to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Let's see what we can jam in by way of preview before the music starts up again. Starting off in the Bistro Cafe, new charges against Manafort could mean he dies in prison. They're not like that worrisome charges, it's just they will put him away. For long. It's not going to give him a heart attack that he's been charged. Then on the rest of the menu, when the world's largest asset fund manager takes the gun manufacturers to the woodshed, people listen. More than 20 states' attorneys general, according with, along with internet groups and companies, have refiled lawsuits. Why? From I'll tell Daily you. Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Group in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Thanks for listening. Joan McCarter knows why. They are attempting to block the net neutrality reversal. And the popular head of the federal agency tasked with helping U.S. states protect election systems from cyber attacks by Russia and other foreign actors is being shoved aside by Paul Ryan and the White House just in time for the midterms. Wonder what that's about. Find out next.